This is my favorite video game. It's a terminal-based game where you simulate the process of mining blocks by spamming the M key. In this video, I want to explore the topic of terminal-based video game development. If you've ever used terminal applications like text editors or monitoring programs and wondered how exactly these programs are able to provide a seemingly graphical interface in the terminal, then you'll enjoy this video. I'll be showing code examples and demonstrations for things like terminal mouse support, keyboard events, colored text, and many other aspects of terminal interaction that you've probably never even heard of before. Let's start out with some of the basic ideas that you need if you want to make a terminal-based game. The first thing you'll need is some way to figure out the dimensions of the terminal. You can use the tput calls command to give you the current width of the terminal, and for the height, you can specify lines instead of calls. So this terminal is currently 61 columns wide and 16 lines tall. And to show you an example of how you could use that, we can use the following nested for loop that simply iterates over every cell so if you want, you could describe this as the uh, startings of a basic game area. So we have a border here on the top and on the left, and there's no border on the bottom or the right-hand side, but if you wanted, you could simply add that to the if condition here. The man page for the tput command is worth reading. You can use it not just for finding the dimensions of a terminal, but it also allows you to do a number of other terminal-related operations. For example, right now you can see I'm typing down at this location, but if I just backspace all that, and if I run this tput command, you'll see that my cursor is now up here. And so now I'm typing up here. Now let's talk about terminal size changes. This nested for loop iterates over the current dimensions of the terminal. And you can see that my border here is currently aligned for this terminal width. However, if I go to full screen here and then change the dimensions of the terminal, you can see that my border is totally broken. And this is predictable because the dimensions of the terminal have changed. So if I run this again, now it's aligned again, but that's because it's printing with the current width. And if I maximize that again, uh, it's broken again. What I really need here is to be able to hook into some kind of event that actually notifies me when the terminal size changes. And that is exactly what this script does. The key ingredient is hooking into this signal, which I assume stands for a signal window change. So if I run this script now and resize the terminal, you can see that it prints out the new dimensions. And if I keep resizing it, it keeps printing out the new dimensions. So by hooking into this event, you can just reprint the screen whenever there is a change in the window size. So now that you can properly figure out the dimensions of the terminal, let's talk about a seemingly small issue that turns out to be fairly complicated, and that is character width calculations. Not all characters are equal width. Most ASCII characters take up only one space, with the exception of things like tabs, vertical tab, or newline character. But many Unicode characters take up more than that. Therefore, you have to do a bit more work to accurately find out how wide a character is. This was a problem that I first became aware of when writing a terminal-based diff tool. The original goal was to have a single file Python script that could work cross-platform. The idea was to make it work both on Windows and on Linux. I put a lot of work into finding utility functions to try and accurately calculate the width of characters. I did have some success for certain languages, but I never found any utility functions that would accurately calculate width for all Unicode code points. To illustrate how hard this problem is to solve, let's look at this example. Here's a simple echo statement that prints out a bunch of R symbols, and here you can see a well-formatted closed box. Now if I go into my terminal settings, do preferences, compatibility, and I change this setting, ambiguous with characters, from narrow to wide, and do close. Now if I take the exact same echo statement and paste it again, you can see that the formatting is totally broken. As you can see, the exact same piece of text can have different width depending on terminal settings. This is something that you have no control over as a programmer. If you want to dig a bit further into the ultimate source of truth on this topic, you can look into the source code for VTE, which is used by GNOME Terminal. Specifically, you can check out the VTE unicar width function. As you can see, this file is over 11,000 lines long, and the exact code here for determining a character width is fairly complicated. From this comment, it even looks as though it's subject to change. If we scroll up a bit, you can see that there's a massive table with a whole bunch of hard-coded widths. Also bear in mind that this is just one individual implementation of a terminal emulator, so it should be clear by now how potentially non-portable these widths are. A fairly accurate way to calculate character widths would be to hook directly into this function in your own code, but that would only be guaranteed to work perfectly for a terminal that used that specific version of the VTE source code. The most authoritative way to get the widths would be to just empirically measure them. Generally speaking, this probably wouldn't be practical, but we can consider it for this discussion. Here I've written a short Python demo specifically for this purpose. The script is fairly simple, and starts by iterating through the first 300 Unicode code points. For each code point, it outputs an ANSI escape sequence to set the cursor to a specific position. 
Then, after the character has been printed, another ANSI escape sequence is issued. This escape sequence allows us to read back the current cursor position. And finally, the measurement results are written to a file for later inspection. Let's go ahead and run the script now. So it's currently printing all the characters. Okay, it's finished. So now we can take a look at the results file. So here is every single character, and this part here shows us what the returned cursor position values were. By subtracting away the initial character position, these values can be used to calculate the character widths. Now if I move that to this location, and let's go back into the preferences and change the compatibility back to wide characters. Close that, and let's run this again. And now let's use Vim to compare the two results. As you can see here, this comparison shows us which characters had a different value returned for their updated cursor positions. In the script that we just ran, there were a couple special ANSI escape sequences, and that is a perfect segue into our next topic, which is ANSI escape codes. Now there are a lot of different ANSI escape sequences that do special things, but I think the best place to start is by showing how you can print colored text with these codes. Now this piece of text looks pretty scary to read. This part here is a single escaped character. The leading zero lets us know it's an octal notation. You'll often see people write this in hexadecimal notation too, but it's really just the same thing. Whenever the terminal sees these two special characters, it will interpret the next few characters as a series of control sequence introducers. In this case, it prints colored text. And if you want to see the same thing in hexadecimal notation, here it is. In this case here, the 31 means a foreground color that's red, and the 42 means a background color that's green. It's worth noting that you can swap the order of these numbers, and if you change these numbers you can get different colors. The color attributes can be turned off with a control sequence that ends in 0M. A common mistake is to forget to include this shutoff sequence, which results in everything that follows being colored using the most recent set of color attributes. If you want to see even more examples of the colors and styles, you can run a for loop like this. As you can see, there's all sorts of options for underlining text, putting a line through it, or making the text blink. ANSI escape sequences are not just for printing colored text. There's also a number of special control operations that they can perform as well. For example, when I run this command to open Vim, and then when I decide to close Vim, you can see that all of the original text from before I ran that command is still on the terminal. This is true even though it looks like it was overwritten by Vim. You might be wondering how to accomplish the same thing. Well, the answer is an ANSI escape code. The escape code that we just ran has activated the alternate screen buffer. It looks like all the information on the previous screen is gone, but we can still return to it. This escape code will let us return from the alternate screen buffer. Note that the only difference with this escape code is the H has been replaced by an L. If we go back to the previous script that I ran, you can see that there are even more ANSI escape sequences that I haven't talked about, such as this one to save the current cursor position, and this one to restore the current cursor position. Most of the color-based ANSI escape sequences are well supported, but not all ANSI escape sequences will work in all terminals. The next important topic to discuss is to show how you can prevent input characters from being echoed back onto the terminal. For example, if I run the date command, and then the uptime command, when I type the characters for the date command and the uptime command, the input that I type is echoed back onto the terminal in real time. It's a common requirement for many applications to prevent this behavior. For this, you can use the STTY command with minus echo. Now if I type the date command again, or the uptime command, you can see that the commands that I type are not echoed under the terminal anymore. You can re-enable echoing by running STTY echo. And since you couldn't see it the first time, this is the command that I ran. One example of an application that you've probably used before that disables echoing is the top command. Within the top application, I can press various keys to change this sort order. However, the keys that I press don't show up on the terminal. To better illustrate the usefulness of disabling character echoing, I've written a simple example script. The script starts by disabling line-based input buffering. This way, I can capture the input one character at a time. For each input character that I type, it simply increments the character value by one and then prints it. If I run the script like this, and then press the F key, you can see that it's printing the letter that comes after F, just as you'd expect. However, in addition to echoing back the G characters, it's still echoing back the original characters that I input. As we just learned, this problem can be solved by disabling character echoing, and most importantly, re-enabling it upon program exit. Now, if I run this program, and again press the F key, you can see that it does just as you'd expect. It takes every character that I input, increments it by one, and then outputs only that character. Another feature of terminal interaction that you might be curious about is how control characters are handled. For example, if I open Vim, and then press Control c 
The Vim program doesn't immediately exit. However, you're probably aware that Control-C will usually exit immediately from a program. You might be wondering how you can override control characters like Control-C in your program. The answer is to use raw terminal mode, as this example illustrates. Here, you can see that we're enabling raw mode as soon as the program starts. If I run the demo like this, and type some characters like this, you can see that each of the characters is echoed to the screen. But if I press Control C, or even Control D, or Control Z, none of these control characters will invoke their usual special behavior. In fact, there is nothing that I can do to escape this program. The only solution is to terminate the program. By overriding the default behavior of these control keys, this allows your program to do something special with them. The most common use case for this feature is to begin some sort of graceful shutdown process. In the case of Vim, this is most likely done to prevent the user from discarding pending changes in the current file. You can check out the man page for the STTY command for all kinds of different flags that you can enable or disable related to the terminal. Another important aspect of terminal input and output that we touched upon is line buffering. If you want to do input or output with individual characters, then line buffering is something you have to be very careful of. If line buffering is enabled, you may not be able to read individual characters from input or output until a new line is encountered. For more information on this topic, you can watch my video on the stdbuff command. The next topic is key up and key down events. This example shows the simplest possible way to obtain key up or key down events in a terminal. If I run the script like this, and press the F key down, and hold it down, and then release, you can see that this gives me accurate key up and key down events. However, if I copy this script to a headless server and try to run it again, you can see that it's not working. This is an important point to understand about terminals. A terminal has no concept of key up or key down events. In fact, it doesn't know anything about keyboards at all. This is a topic that I've explored in significant detail in the following blog post. In this blog post, I have a number of different examples that show how you can detect key up events in a variety of different situations. Many of these solutions have trade-offs, so you'll have to think about what works best for your situation. Realistically, it makes sense that key up events don't work over an SSH connection to a headless server. Unless you're using X-forwarding, an SSH connection doesn't know anything about your keyboard. In general, there's also security considerations about listening to all keyboard events. If a low-privileged terminal application running in the background can listen to all keyboard events, that basically gives you a keylogger. The next topic is a very subtle one that you've probably never really thought about, but it's very important for user interaction. If I press the F key and hold it down, you'll notice that it types one character instantly and then delays for a while. Then, after the delay, characters start outputting rapidly. This behavior is called keyboard auto-repeating, and you can change this behavior with the xset command. If I run this command, and then press the F key, you can see that there's minimal initial delay now. Also, the characters type much faster. In fact, it's barely usable now. If I try to type hello world, this is what I get. That's the best I can do. In fact, if you try this, you need a reset command that you can copy-paste. Trying to type in the terminal is now impossible. In this command, the first value provides the initial delay before auto-repeating kicks in, and the second value provides the character repeat rate. As its name suggests, the xset command only works within the context of an X server. You can use xsetq to show useful debug information about the current settings of your input. The man page is also worth reading. Now, as I described, the xset command only works for a graphical environment, so that leaves the question, how do you change the keyboard auto-repeat rate if you're not in a graphical environment? So for the next part, I'll be switching to the Linux console. And to do that, I'll use Control alt f 3 So as you can see, I'm on the Linux console now. Just for fun, let's try to run the xset command here. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. Instead, we can use the kbd rate command on the console. Now I'll try pressing and holding the F key. As you can see, the delay is now much greater. And now I'll use this command to set it back to something more reasonable. While we're on the topic of the Linux console, let's talk about another problem that you might encounter in these primitive terminal environments. And that problem is displaying Unicode characters. Here's a piece of text that contains some Japanese characters. As you can see, the characters don't display properly. In this context, I can use another terminal tool that will allow me to display these characters. As you can see, the characters are now rendered properly. Another very confusing issue to debug with malformed characters is related to language or encoding settings. In particular, let's look at an example that involves the LC C type variable. As you can see, its current value is empty. If I open this script in Vim, I can see the following Japanese characters rendered clearly. However, if I change the LC C type variable to this, and open the file again, you can see that the characters are not rendered properly. In this situation, the LCC type variable gives incorrect information to the Vim program. 
Vim will then attempt to display these UTF-8 characters as ISO 88591 characters. If we change the LCC type variable back to nothing, the file is once again rendered properly. The LCC type variable is just one of many language related variables. There's also lang, lc all, and lc collate. Let's take a look at another character rendering issue that's not related to variables, but terminal encodings instead. Here's the output from our script which renders properly. However, if I change the terminal character encoding from UTF-8 to a legacy Chinese encoding, and then output the same script again, you can see that it doesn't render properly. If I open this file in Vim now, you can see that it still doesn't render properly. If I change the encoding back to UTF-8, the characters now render properly again. We can also see what happens if we make a copy of the script, and in the process, convert it from UTF-8 to UTF-16. If I try to print this script to the terminal, you can see that it doesn't render properly. However, if I open this file in Vim, you can see that it's rendered properly, even though it doesn't output clearly on the terminal. This is because Vim is able to recognize the different encoding of the file. Vim automatically converts the file from native UTF-16 and displays it in our terminal in UTF-8. Note that in the bottom it says converted. Now let's talk about terminal support for mouse events. If I run the following ANSI escape sequence in the terminal, like this, I'll see a whole bunch of output every time I move the mouse cursor. If I then echo this ANSI escape sequence, the output turns off. The strange looking output that you see here actually contains the information that we need for keeping track of mouse events. For the next demo, I've leveraged a piece of source code from this web page. In particular, the example shown at the end of this article. In my case, the example code didn't work as provided. I also found that I had to add this function call to actually receive mouse events. According to the documentation, this function call turns on keypad translation for input sequences. I also needed to set the mouse interval to avoid missing short mouse clicks. In addition, I also added detection for more mouse events and reporting of the mouse position. To compile this and put it all together, I used this command, and here is the result. As you can see, this is a fully terminal-based program that detects mouse clicks and detects the mouse movements. If you want to check out where some of these mouse events are defined, you can check the source code for the nCurses library, and that's an excellent segue into discussing the nCurses package itself. If you write applications for the terminal, sooner or later you're bound to come across the nCurses package. If you're ever wondering if a certain feature is even possible in the terminal or not, it's worth checking out the test cases for the nCurses package. I believe the nCurses tests are only designed to be run on the specific version of nCurses after it's been installed. However, I found you can just run the configure script as if you were going to install it. Then, you can simply run make. Now in my case, nCurses is already installed in this machine, so I don't want to overwrite the existing version. But if I cd to the test directory, now I can see all the tests are available. Let's run a few of these tests now. Here's one called Firework. Here's one called Test Mouse. Here's one called Demo Menus. Here's one called Night. Here's one called Hanoi. Here's one called Xmas. And here's a test called Dots. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, consider becoming a member of this YouTube channel. Members of the channel are granted a license that allows them to legally play my video game. The source code for my game can be downloaded by anyone from GitHub, but you're not allowed to play the game unless you become a channel member. Please do not illegally pirate my video game.